So hello, welcome everyone to form and community demo number 146. This is where we share highlights of what has happened in the community recently. My name is Anita and I'll be hosting the demo today. You can ask questions here in the chat and I will do my best to monitor the chat. Or you can head over to the metric room at the forum and I will also do my best to monitor the conversation there. On the agenda today, uh, we have, we've got a packed agenda today, actually. Uh, we're going to start with a little announcement about Foreman 3.12 being available. Then I'll share a few details about uh, config management camp call, call for papers. And then Ian will talk about Catilla future feature development updates, and then we'll have Valdirio talking about format and control development environment setup. And it seems that Chris might be also, yeah, uh, talking about his topic at the end, but we don't know what that is going to be, so it's going to be a little surprise. So let me start by sharing the great news that format 3.12 is available. Uh, new features include improvements to the new all hosts index page and full support for Puppet 8 and, of course, more. So if you want to know more about the new release, head over to the Foreman page. Then about the conflict management camp call, call for papers, that's going to be open until October 3rd. Uh, until the end of October. And uh, the team is looking for open source topics related to infrastructure. They accept a broad range of proposal types ranging from Ignite talks to presentations and workshops. So if you have a topic of your own in mind, consider submitting a proposal. And next we have Ian with his topic. So Ian, please take it away. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Then I'll get started. All righty. So I'm going to be talking about um, some future feature updates from the Catello team. Uh, so most of these features are still going through their design and implementation is either just barely starting on the more researchy type topics um, or hasn't started yet. Uh, so let me step through these topics. Um, I think a few of them haven't been presented to the community yet as RFCs, uh, but they should be shortly. So let's just jump right in. So the first issue that we have here was something that we tried to get in for Catella 414, but it was getting a bit too close to the um, stability period or even past the stability period. And so we decided it was too risky. So now it's being done for Catella 415. And this is the removal of the PostgreSQL EVR extension. Um, for anyone who uses remote databases, you've probably had to interact directly with this. It's a separate RPM that we package that you have to install on your machine. And there are a couple of reasons why we'd like to get rid of this. Firstly, so we don't have to keep track of packaging extra RPM, but also uh, with this gone, it enables support for remote databases in managed cloud infrastructure. Um, we've had some requests over the years from users who wanted to put their databases in cloud systems that don't give them any access to the root shell. And you need that access to the root shell to enable the extension. So we only support uh, these remote databases being on machines that you have full control of. But once this is gone, we can remove that requirement. So this should be great for the community. Um, and you can track some of the progress through that form an issue up there. Um, this is the main Catello change. We're also going to have some changes in the documentation and also in the form installer. 
So next up, uh, there are going to be a few epics that are all somewhat related to container content. Um, so if anyone's used the Catello container registry, if you've synced container repositories before, um, you might have clicked through some of the menus for the content units and noticed that um, there's not a whole lot of information that you get about the manifests or the tags. Um, you certainly not as much information as you get if you look at a registry uh, like Quay, for example. Um, and so we're looking to revamp this. There's a lot more information that we want to actually show about the uh, images information like the size of the, the full compressed size of the image, um, the architecture, if it exists, the operating system, if that exists, and then any labels or annotations that are attached to the manifests, and then the type of manifest, um, which originally we had as either bootable or flat pack, which uh, I'll talk a bit more about the uh, interesting bootable part in the next slide. Um, but we also want to start showing if it's a flat pack. And then there are other manifest types as well. So we want to be able to show if it's one of those types. And not only do we want to show more information, we also need to reduce our Angular JS stack. Um, since there are concerns about support for the version of Angular that we're using, um, we're slowly converting them all over to React. And that also has the benefit of us being able to modernize the UI to make it look more consistent and generally provide a better uh, user uh, workflow. So I mentioned some of the types. So we have a new exciting feature coming up. Um, in case you have seen the blog post uh, posted by Red Hat, um, there is a new mode, so to speak, uh, for our uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. And this mode is called image mode. Um, and so the machine types are image mode, package mode. Um, and with this new mode, we need to make sure that we can differentiate between the two sorts of systems. Um, for anyone who isn't in the know about it, I'd highly recommend reading the blog post and giving it a try, actually booting up one of these machines. Um, I've posted a link to the CentOS Boot C repository there. Uh, from there, you can use that machine um, and then in coordination with either Kickstart or um, uh, the uh, Boot C image builder repository, you can create an actual, you can provision an actual Boot C system from a container image. Uh, and I won't go into the technical details. I would just say read the blog post and you'll get a better understanding of how it works. But it's an exciting new technology. Um, so, some things that we are designing and figuring out how we're going to fit into Catello are things like um, image management of the Rebootsy execution. So you don't yum update packages, DNF update packages on these machines. Instead, you use boot C to either upgrade the container image on the machine or point to a different container image. So we need to use remote execution and have it be as nice as package actions are. We also need to differentiate between the host types, if it's a package mode system, or if it's one of these boot C slash image mode systems, and then also um, we need to disable package level actions on these boot C machines. Um, since they use OS tree under the hood, uh, a lot of the file system is immutable and it doesn't make sense to install packages in there. So we shouldn't let you do things if they don't make sense. And so in our little topics and new things we're looking at supporting, um, we're also going to be rolling, we're planning on rolling out sometime soon, um, OCI Flatpak support. And this is something that, again, like the uh, bootable host one, you should see an RFC about this very shortly. Um, so I hopefully a lot of folks have heard of flat packs. They're used with desktop machines. Um, and Catello currently cannot mirror them without hacks. Um, we have the two plugins installed that are related to the flat pack technology. Um, the closest one to working being container, uh, because OCI flat packs use container technology under the hood. So technically today you could synchronize some flat pack repository and then with a, a hack and pulp, 
you could have the index get built and then you could actually point the client and consume flat packs. Um, now I mentioned two plugins. The other type is the type of flat pack that you see on FlatHub, which use OS tree under the hood. Um, Pulp doesn't, now while Pulp has an OS tree plugin, it currently doesn't have support for the, um, uh, for flat packs. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be rolling, we're planning on rolling out this OCI Flatpak support, um, seeing community interest, and then after that we can consider adding the full support so we can support FlatHub. And then I just have a couple of links below about what the uh, OCI, some source examples where we can get the OCI Flatpaks, like flatpaks.redheada or registry.doraproject.org. Then, other exciting features. Um, this feature has been started quite a long time ago. Can't remember which release it started in exactly, but multi, -con multi content views. So, this feature is great for folks who are tired of using composite content views to mix and match their content views for different kinds of hosts. So, with this feature, you're able to assign multiple content view environment combinations to hosts and also activation keys as well. And so the upcoming work now, while this is technically enabled, so uh, you can register your host with multiple content view environments, um, it's not a fully fledged feature yet until this is finished, which is currently in development. Um, and the features that are being focused in the short term are firstly getting this also working for activation keys. Um, the previous work that was done only allowed assigning multiple content view environments to hosts. And what's also great is you'll be able to actually see this stuff in the UI, which you couldn't before. You would just, um, previously it was sort of a hack for the really hardcore users who wanted to test this out. And then really the most important thing is that once this is done, the multi-CV feature will be done enough for users to actually use it and benefit from the uh, from the feature. And let's see, my coworker Jeremy says, originally in Catello 4.8, this feature started. So these are all of the updates that I had. Um, I would like to add, if, uh, if any of my colleagues here do have anything else interesting that they'd like to add, or maybe something I missed in the previous ones, is feel free to uh, mention it now, but if not, uh, that was all I had. Thank you, Ian, for all the updates. Is there anyone else who would like to add something? That sounds like a no, and because I don't see any questions in any of the chats either, I think we can move on to the next topic. And that's Foreman and Catalo Development Environment Setup. So, Algeria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? And let me share my screen. Can you see that? All right, so good morning, guys. Uh, the main point here, I didn't prepare any presentation or slide for today. Uh, I received this invite like last night, a few hours ago, and I just jump in. So the main point is, it is more like one invite if you are knowing this project right now, like Foreman, this is an amazing project. We will love to have you here contributing and helping on this, this project, like Foreman, Catello, and any other project that we do have. But I believe the main point, the main question in this initial time is how can I prepare my development environment? Is this a simple thing? Is this a, a easy way to move it on? Eventually, yes like when you know a little bit more but if you're in the beginning very very beginning and if you have no idea this can be a little bit painful and today's video or this session specifically is to put this easy for you okay so let me let me show this project this is the forum and this is the organization and we have many repositories over here under this project 
One of them is forklift. Forklift is one application uh, that uses uh, a combination of different tools like Vagrant, Ansible, and, and many more just to deploy this configuration. But if you take a look on this page, we have a lot of configurations. We have amazing links here. Uh, I recommend you to take a look on them. But you can see that you have some requirements, like I need Vagrant, I need Ansible, I need this, plug, this plugin, I need some additional stuff. And then Wally, again, I'm just starting now. I have no, no idea. I, yeah. So how can I do this like since the beginning up to the end? I would like to start right now, like close this session and then download my ISO, my CentOS 9 stream or my CentOS stream 9 and then put this up and running. Can I? Yes. So let me show you this. Uh, this is my channel. I have some videos here, most of them foreman slash satellites. And I released this one yesterday. So basically in this video, let me open this one. Uh, if you scroll down, two things that I like to, to show here in all the videos I do this, like you can click on this intro, you can see the arrow. Basically I like to put chapters because this video, for example, is one hour long. So you can say this is boring, but if you know the information that you're looking for and the place, then you can go straight to that point and you can take a look. So from here, you can see like introduction, no in forklift project, brand new CentOS stream, and go on. So all these steps to deploy your machine to prepare your development environment are here. Okay, so believe me, you can follow this step at the end of the day you get your environment up and running, ready to roll. Another point that I would like to mention is this one. Sometimes you have developers developing on their own laptop or notebook or desktop. And then they will land over here, the first or the left side. In a, in a different scenario, you see someone like me, like I have my desktop. Let's say that my desktop is 10, 10, 10, 1. This is my IP address. And then I have my development box, like external machine. And Wally, why is that? In my case, for example, I'm using Mac, ARM2, and I can tell you for sure, virtualization here is not a thing. So I have to virtualize, virtualize this machine outside. I'm using this dev box machine, uh, CentOS string, or any, any other version. But yeah, I'm using CentOS string here, nine and that's dev box. And then this stable machine, it's like an internal virtual machine on top of that, that guy. So basically this is another scenario. And at the end of the day, I would like to be able to access this virtual machine and then develop and do my thing, all right? So can I do this? Definitely you can. So if we come back here, all the commands that we're using in this procedure or in this video are here because, you know, I'm your friend, so I'm here just to help you. Uh, you don't have to be reading the files or reading the commands on the video and then typing. So just copy and paste everything here on your end. This is gonna work as well. One slightly detail that I would like to show you here. You can see on this one, and then there is this GitHub nick. Initially, this was something like this. So there is this, angle brackets, uh, YouTube doesn't allow me to add the angle brackets. So you can see this in the video. I have a mention, I have a label about this on the video, but if you just copy and paste, uh, keep in mind that you need to add this one here just to keep the correct configuration uh, in this EMO file, all right? Okay, again, if you pass through all this video, uh, you see the explanation of each command, why I'm doing this, why I'm installing Ansible Core, why installing rsync, why installing this, why downloading this uh, repository. Yeah, it's very clear, explained video, simple to follow. This is the main idea. In this channel, you can also see that I have some playlists and one that I like, and I would like to recommend to you guys uh, who are watching this video is this one, Foreman Dev. If you take a look on Foreman Dev, there are different videos about development that will help you to understand how we do on 
on open source, basically. So if you are brand new on Git a workflow and you have no idea, like, okay, there is this upstream, I have to fork this to my account, I have to clone to my machine, I'll create a branch, are you? A lot of technical stuff, uh, slash workflow, yeah, this can definitely help you to, to do the initial steps. This is your development environment. So your development environment will be up and running. And after that, there are some tools that can help you to improve your development skills and the time, the development time. So for example, uh, we use VS Code or I use VS Code. In general, other developers uh, working with this project, they will be using VS Code. And then we have VS Code plus Icon. There is one plugin that can turn this uh, a bit more comfortable and will help you visually speaking. Uh, Vim, if you are a Vim lover, definitely you can improve and work with Vim plugin in your VS Code. So now we are combining like the power of Vim plus the power of VS Code all together. Pretty cool, pretty nice. Trading space, if, if there are some space in your code that you can see, yeah, believe me, there are some, some stuff that you can see. This is gonna help you just providing some hints. This is the, the one that I love the most because this is VS Code uh, using SSCH. And what does it mean? If we return to this picture, I'm here. And then my machine, the machine that I'm developing is here. So, okay, I have to do a SSCH, I have to connect, I have to open a terminal, something like this. This terminal over here is on that machine. Uh, I can do that, but no, check this out. This is my VS code. You can see that I'm connected to this dev box uh, machine. And this is the terminal on that specific server. The virtual machine run on top of my development box. So again, if you like to see more about this, that video is gonna explain this to you so you can Basically, have a configuration to that machine. We have the port redirect. So again, everything is pretty well explained in that video. All right, let's move it on. And yes, there are also some bonus here, like about Git configuration. Uh, this is one configuration that I like the most. Uh, I made another session here talking about Tableau. And one thing is, let's suppose that I have Waldirio and Pinheiro in one machine that I'm working as a developer. And then another one that I have just Waldirio, another one that I have a different email. So following procedures like this, even if you have multiple development boxes, uh, definitely you can keep this constant. You can keep this like the same information and definitely this will help if someone would like to do some sort of analysis on the logs and this kind of stuff. All right. Um, just to summarize, yeah, this one is satellite. If you have no idea about satellite, like we have the upstream project, the upstream is Foreman, Foreman, Catel, and all the other components, but Foreman, the main one, and the downstream is Red Hat Satellite. So this is one basic workflow about satellite. Uh, since the beginning, like installing satellites up to registering the content hosts. All right, this is the main idea, the main point. And at the end of the day, you will end up on something like this. I have my dev box and yeah, you're right. You can see here the FQDN, not the IP address. I can open also the IP address. And if you're asking me, is this by default out of the box? No, there is one configuration that you need to do. And this is also on the video, so don't miss it. So you can access the port, you can see all the feature, you can see the logs. Again, this is pretty neat, pretty useful. Uh, I truly recommend you to take a look on this video and don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell and share with your friend who would like to enjoy this amazing and new world of development in Formula. And I believe this is all for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Valdera. Valdera. Very neat demo. Uh, I don't see any questions in any of the chats, so I think we can continue.
with the next topic, which is uh, Chris's presentation on the package removal wizards. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a slide for that, but I don't think that's going to be an issue. So, Chris. We can't hear you. Okay. It's really quiet. Is that better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Yeah. Windows. All right. Um, so, so we have, so what I was going to talk about today is we have this all new host page right here. Um, and we have this manage content. Oh, let me just refresh it here. So I'll just pick a box here. That was why. So we have this uh, manage packages on this new host page wizard. And what we did was we added a, um, we had upgrade all, upgrade and install, but we never actually had the ability to remove packages. And so what we did is we added that. So I'll show you that. And so what initially this looked like though is it looked like this we were using the rpm um i could tell rpm model so what you would see here is you see like just duplicate 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 especially if you have multiple hosts you would have like five abrts five kernels and that's just pretty ugly so what we did is we switched and did some things in the background to just be able to look at the installed packages and then we brought in just made that unique so we only show one package um so if you've got five hosts registered we instead of five kernels we just have one kernel and so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to demo it real quick so i've demoed it here or installed a couple packages here so we've installed a package on let me just make sure it's on this guy what host is this all right so we're going to go ahead and remove it from this host right here so i'll show you what this looks like here so we'll go here Manage content packages, remove packages. So you can see how much better this looks. Um, before, like I said, you would have four or five duplicates in there. So I installed tree. So I'm just going to do use our handy search here. If I can spell. So we've got a package named tree. We're going to do that. Yes, and so we can do here, we can do remove remote execution or we can customize that action. For the sake of the time of the demo, I'm just going to do remote. Um, and then we can, just a regular way, we can see what packages we are removing. We can also go back and edit those two fields. So I'm just going to hit remove. And we'll get our job here. Let me just open that just to make sure. All right, that came back green. So we should get a green toast message here in a moment. Yep, there we go. So that's basically what I wanted to demo because initially, like I said, we were going to ship it with it looking, um, where was it, like this, and that's just not user-friendly at all. So we went right back right before the, the GA and we got that corrected and it looks a lot better. Um, well, that's that's all I had to demo. So let me stop sharing here. Uh, sure. Oh, and then also, if if um, for example, if you have a package that's not installed on a host, so say you have two hosts, one has tree, one doesn't, and you select two hosts, the first one will fire off with the toast success that we saw, and the other one will come back in a, as an error, just saying the package is not available. Uh, sure, VJ. Hey, Chris. Uh, I have to later to like uh, the package if that's not applicable to my second hole. Will the entire process get failed or will it be success? It will be, um, yeah. So, what will happen is it will kick off two jobs and we'll see, um, you'll see one host, the host that had the, um, that had the package will go green and the other one, like Jeremy coming in, will, will fail. Um, so we can try it real quick here if you want. Um, that will be helpful. Yes, yeah, so let me just share here again. All right. 
right. So on this one, we'll install the tree package again. And this would only take a second. But I did. That could be my just UI. Just refresh it here. It is running from a dev box. I didn't have time to spin up one yesterday. Like a like a nightly. All right, so let's do install packages. Same equals tree. All right. So that should go through. All right, we've got our toast now. There we go. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to select two packages now, or two hosts, I mean, and we'll go ahead and remove packages. And we'll do name equals tree. So we've got two hosts. The top one has the tree package. This one doesn't. Um, so let's go ahead and try that here. So we go to the job details. Oh, crap. <laughs> Did the other one have it on there? All right, well, we'll just try to do this again. So let's do remove packages. I was trying to play around with the demo to see which box would work faster. All right. Uh, I don't know if that's... Let me bring up a terminal to them. Uh, sure, well, Dario. Hey, Toledo, you can click on the link of the server. Probably there is a message saying nothing to be removed. Like you can open in two different tabs, like the row nine. Yeah, you can you can click on the link. Okay. On the left side. Yeah, for this one, for example, we can see that the package was removed. Let's let's return. Let's click on the second one. Yeah, uh, no. yeah. This this is one behavior that I see in different tasks. Uh, I I don't believe we need to pass through those machines once there is no package. But okay. this is something very common. Like all the time, if you run this ten times. I believe all, all of them you'll be able to see like this machine and nothing to do. This is, is the current behavior. Oh, okay. Definitely we can we, we can improve that. Uh go on, Vijay, please. Yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly my assumption was like it always going to show uh success, uh irrespective of whether it is success or not. I'm thinking from like if or if someone is using format and applying it for 100 hosts, like, it will become hard to understand like where it's really succeed. Right. But yeah, that's fine. We can take it offline. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, so that's, that's what happens if it's not there. So thanks, Waldirio. Um, then is there is any other questions? I was just testing if you try a DNF package remove and then you print the exit code at zero. So to DNF, removing no package is a success. Oh, so we're looking at that. Okay. Yes, complementing this, uh, we are not using DNF. Uh, we are using the commands. Is that right? Uh. Um, when calling like the Ansible, we are using the command, and that command in general we recruit, we execute, and the output of dollar question mark will always be zero. Definitely, we can we can improve this. We can check this this out. 
Yeah, I definitely think yeah we should raise a bug for that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Chris. Uh, we even had a real time troubleshooting session. <laughs> uh, I don't think there are any more questions in the chat. So does anyone want to add anything else? OK, in this case, I think we can wrap it up for today. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. And let me just say that the next demo is scheduled for October 24th. So hopefully see you then. All right, thanks all.